Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And yeah, today I'm going to talk about developing for our users. This probably doesn't mean much to you. I had to use a title. I never know what, what titles to use for my presentations. It's a bit mystical, and you're probably wondering. But as soon as I explain to you what, who am I, maybe you will start understanding. Um, I am Alesh. I have been developing in KDE for over 10 years. And well, my first two projects, one was a tiny educational application called KeyAlgebra, and the second one was uh, KDevelop, uh, an ID. I mean, KDevelop wasn't mine, but I started contributing to it as soon as I started uh, doing stuff in KDE. And this is related because I, I have been experiencing both the little application kind of thing where, well, you're working on your stuff and you want to get it to the users and, well, you're not a big, big project, so like big distros and operating systems weren't uh, caring that much about me. Actually, they were, but I wasn't really aware of it, at least at that time. And then on the other side, I, I, I got to think about what are the developer's pro problems and how does one actually develop an application and um, what kind of tools w would one need to be happy and well, sometimes I think we manage to deliver them, and, but not always. Um, and in general, as being part of, of the KD community, one thing that you need to think about and you, you keep being reminded of is that you need to make it easy to contribute, right? Most of the people who work with us are not because they have a boss who told them you have to work on that because it's very important for whoever. And if you don't do that, you're not going to be paid, right? We need to make it easy and, and, and exciting. And one part about making it easy is to, well, have a straight and meaningful line between I have an idea that I want to implement and I can start implementing it without having to go through hoops, technical hoops, regarding, I don't know, you need to install dependencies, you need to recompile the kernel, right? No, not, not so fun stuff. It's something that, well, the whole community has been working on for, for years. KD has been working on it. Linux has been working on it. And actually, like, open source is thriving on it. And, well, now I'm going to talk to you about uh, how I think we could improve it some, somehow in, in KD. So today, to develop any KDE application, basically, one usually needs Qt, which is the biggest framework we are based on. But then we have a ton of frameworks because, well, over the years, we've started creating them because we realized that, well, Qt wasn't offering everything we needed. So, uh, and we had shared needs, so we started implementing them and we put them together into frameworks. This means that as soon as you start developing for an application, you will realize that it's not just about installing the dependencies, uh, well, Qt as a dependencies, but all of the KD frameworks, which uh, you, since you're developing as well, you will need like fairly recent uh, versions of these frameworks, which are not always part of the distribution. This also gets more complex well, as soon as you start, stop thinking about Linux strictly, right? Like if you want to develop, let's say, key algebra for Android or for Windows, you want to have a nice distribution who is doing the work for you, you will have to go yourself and fish for all of these uh, dependencies and, and, well, take the, whatever action you need to take by yourself. And that's not super fun always. But that, that's the idea. You, you, you get started. And before you can actually start doing your development, you have to look at the weirdly complex dependency tree that you need to sort out right before you start doing what you actually came to do. Also, there are very different Linuxes. Like We like to talk about Linux as if it was just the one thing, or the new Linux as if it was the, the one thing. But like, if you think about it, there's like a lot of very different things. We can think about the normal distros, like Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, and all of that. But then the, the spectrum is much wider, right? Like there's, very, like there's Yocto, for example. There's Android. It can also be considered the Linux. And, it's not always trivial to like cater this with, with one approach, at least not so far. We're, let's see if we can improve it. And then, as I was saying, there's different operating systems. One of the things that we tell developers when, when, when they work with us is that if you create an application that works properly in a KD setup and you're not doing crazy things, 
very specific to uh, like Plasma, for example, you will be able to run these applications on on these uh, different operating systems, which actually makes a lot of sense, right? Like there's a lot of the, our user base that sometimes will be on Windows, sometimes will be on OS X, sometimes will be on Android. And, and we cannot disregard this, this, this use case. It's, it's part of how this society behaves and we need to cater to that. And we also have a very different form factors. We cannot say our application only works on desktop unless it's a very desktop specific use case. Our users will be, uh, well, walking sometimes and just saying to them, well, you're out of luck because you're not sitting in front of, of a big screen in a, in a laptop computer is, is not really an option, at, at least I think so. So, We've had solutions for that. Like, for example, we came up with the KD source build tool like many years ago, and it's actually something that we have very properly documented on our wikis about, it. and it actually tries to solve all of these issues. But uh, well, it's something that we know about because it's part of our culture. But as an outsider, you don't want to <laughs> straight away have to learn about the 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 culture when what you wanted to do it was to fix something or to get something done, right? So um, let's see what other people have been doing and thinking about when doing these kind of things. Um, the first uh, solution that came to my mind when I started to think about this was is Docker, which is, well, it's a very widespread uh, technology and I think it's, it's really cool. One, one thing very specific about Docker is that you usually will build your images on top of uh, another distro, a uh, very, which is it's really interesting because you as a Linux user already, you will have some kind of knowledge on how the technology works. And actually all of this knowledge you have can be built on top of, of Docker. You just need to learn the two or three specific semantics and how it behaves, but if you're a hardcore Debian user, you will be able to use uh, um, your Debian knowledge on top of Docker. Another really interesting thing about Docker is that most of us as developers, we use just the one operating system because, well, you don't use two or three operating systems at the same time, right, on a computer. And if you need to test something on a different distribution, it's always a possibility to do so on, on, on Docker. One, one thing quite interesting that uh, the Neon developers did some, some years ago, or months at least, was to create uh, already pre-built uh, images for, uh, Neon images for Docker. So basically you can just pull their image and start executing whatever it has, or create your own Docker images based on top of these, just installing whatever application you're looking for. This, for example, as uh, a user, if you want to test a new version of, let's say, Krita or Kate, Kdevelop, or whatever you like, you can just uh, use that Docker image and, and pull it. That said, it's not something that uh, we have been exploring, at least so far I haven't, and I don't know if somebody else has explored it as a solution for actually distributing software and recommending it to the, to the end user, which is actually where I'm going. Like When we're developing, we want to have our users on, on a release that is maintained by us. When, what I want is that if I, one of my users finds an issue in my, in my software, he can tell me, I have this issue. I can say, I'm sorry, I can fix it, and then, and then say, well, you're welcome. <laughs> and he needs to be able to get this new, this new uh, version of my software with the fix. What is not really acceptable is that since you got, he got this old version that is already shipped by somewhere, someone else, well, he's out of luck and he has to wait for whatever upgrade he gets because, well, this harms, actually this harms all of us, right? Like it harms us because we're not able to deliver to them the experience that we want it harms the user because, well, he has a software that doesn't use. And it actually uh, harms the distributor because, well, he has unhappy users because of the, the policies that are there for good reasons, but, well, they're not flawless as any policy, right? 
then during the last few years, there's been uh, these two technologies that I sometimes blob together, which are Flatpak and Snap. The, they're basically based on the same technology that um, on the same technology that Docker is based, but they're uh, already designed to to distribute software to be used exactly by end users. Uh, Flatpak is more specifically made for desktop applications. Snap is more of a do whatever you want with it thing. Uh, also, an, uh, a very interesting thing is that they have a specific uh, security model that that allows well. Since you know that the users will be pulling this kind of um, th these applications into their system without knowing where it's coming from, the the systems can actually give you some kind of information about whether the application is going to well steal your data or not. In the end, there's going to be, be always like as soon as an application asks for a privilege, you get to give it some credit, right? But well, still making free software and based it on these systems should always make the users as well a bit more, more, more confident. Because in, in the end, like, where we're coming from is that the security model we always had was the distro knows their shit and they're very good at it. Which is, it's really cool and it's possibly the reason why we are not full of viruses all over our systems. I've personally never had a virus on my system, at least that I know of. And, and the reason is because I've been, well, getting my software from, from uh, v very good distributions over the years who, well, actually weren't distributing uh, viruses to me. But as, as, long as, as soon as I start pulling things from the internet, I can see how this, this could, could be a thing. Especially since we're, most of us are using X11 and, well, lots of technology that aren't, are built bas basically on this premise on that there will actually not be any viruses on your system or malicious software. So as soon as I, I got to the realization that there were some tools that we could be using better for, for both distributing our software and to actually develop on, uh, I thought, well, now it's moment to well, take back my, my K-Develop experience and see how we can actually put this in practice in a way that is actually useful for, for our users. So here's uh, a couple of videos I, I prepared for from my last blog post. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, to explain a bit how these um, technologies works. This is, for example, a, a, an example uh, for, for the Docker integration I did. So basically what happened was that I started a Python application that didn't have all of the dependencies because they were not part of my system. So I created that Docker image and then built a system which will have these uh, dependencies. And then I switched my kdevelop runtime into the Docker one. And now kdevelop, everything it sees is what's in that Docker. All of the dependencies that it looks for will be in the Docker and won't be whatever I have on my system, right? If you think about it, every software we've been developing so far, unless you were using these technologies for sure, or others, is software that was actually meant to use on our computer. It was strictly relying on the state of our computer to work. But this system is not the system that our users have. Admittedly, it's a very similar system, but it's not always the case. And for example, Docker will give you like the, the security that it's, it's being um, done in a, in a pristine, clean system, right? So, well, I don't know if you realize, but basically the end of the example, well, you, it reruns the application. All of the imports are resolved because the, the Docker script uh, took care of the, of the dependencies, and then when it executed, it, um, it worked. It's not just about being able to install the dependencies, though. It's about how me, as a new developer, I didn't have to configure my system in very obscure or ways that I didn't really understand. I just installed um, a Docker image, which is something living in my, my, in my file system, but not really compromising it or even 
making it dirty, and just de developing something on it. Um, now here's another example. As you see, it's three minutes. It's much longer, but it's essentially doing exactly the same thing, but with Flatpak, right? So here uh, it's showing an example of, of Arc. It's first it executed my local Arc. It's using my dependencies on my, on my system. And, and since I have already my KD frameworks, everything built, I, I already had it running, right? But then I created a, a new um, runtime using the, the Flatpak one, and now it's going to compile the application using the dependencies as specified as, uh, as a Flatpak application. This takes much longer, but it takes much longer because um, the application is being built by well, using a C++ compiler, and C++ needs to compile all of the files. It's also a much bigger project, right? But it's not, not, nothing really out of the, 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 the normal that it's, it's doing. It's just recompiling a project from scratch against uh, a different set of libraries. This is especially interesting as well because we get to ensure that all of the developers will be using the same de dependencies, and all of the users will be using the dependencies that we are choosing, right? So if a user has a problem, we will be having that problem as well. So reproducing a, a, an issue is just something that happens straight away. Also, an interesting thing is that the resulting binary could be potentially created by us. So, well, it's something that we can even send to the user and actually have him, well, test it. I can skip a bit the compilation part, but basically the conclusion of the video is that, well, the arc also started when it was built on by, by Flatpak, and well, life goes on. And this is also another example. I, one of the things I wanted to do when, when working on this was that I foresee that if we start uh, pushing developers to develop for uh, the Plasma phone, we'll very soon see that it's, it becomes quite complex to do the whole, I develop on my, on my, on my laptop and I actually execute it on my, on my phone. And actually that's what happened when we started working on it. What we did was to actually compile the application on the phone and actually uh, just display, well, execute it from there. So what happened with the video? Hello. Ooh. For fuck's sake. Does anybody know what happened? Well, let's try again. It's a quick video anyway. So what, what the, this video does is that I am developing an application on my laptop. I get to execute it locally. Uh, but then at some point, I want to execute it on another device. In this case, I was using my Slimbook, but it could be a Plasma phone, theoretically. So well, it's just sending over the application to the other system, and then it's executing also on the other system, and then thumbs up, right? And then, 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 well, that's just another example. So by now, the, the, it's really important that we start looking into this because these technologies are blooming now. We need to make sure that we can help drive the development of these. We also, um, well, we can start leveraging such technologies, which is brilliant. And to do that, we need to get project maintainers to realize that this is a problem and it, it is actually an opportunity, right? We need to start providing recipes to, to have these applications built. At the moment, we have a bunch of, um, well, recipes for nightly builds, but I am not going to become responsible for making the stable releases for every application. If an application is interested, they can do so, and I'll be happy about it. Um, I, actually, I will help you guys get onto it, but I need project maintainers to take responsibility there. I also want, um, I think it's also good that we remind that it's very important because it shortens very much so the feedback loop between um, the users and in our, our state. And we also need users to demand supported software. It's not, it's not acceptable that a user is using uh, 
version of our software that is not being maintained. If they have a problem, we won't be able to solve it. And that's, that is a big, a big problem. It's a big problem that we need to solve, and we need to solve it now. And I want you guys as users to make it happen. You need to become annoying. You need to say, I am using this distro, and I don't have ways to use your supported software. If you don't listen to me, I will call Alej and throw him at you. And distributors, well, don't frown, which is something that very often happens. It's something good for the community. I, I, I want to go work together with you guys. Actually, some of this work is very, very similar to the work you guys have been doing so far. And I think that, well, we can very much use your help. And otherwise, we can very much use your collaboration. It's something that will help the whole open source and Linux community grow. And I want to do it together. So that's what I wanted to say. If you have any questions, you can do it now or later in the hallways or whenever you want to. Although if you do it now, somebody else might hear your ans uh, the answer as well, which is a plus. Questions? There's no questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. So our next speaker is John Baptist Marzel, who is a maintainer of KDN Live. And the topic he's going to talk is KDN Live, rewriting the timeline. 